Army's Corps of Engineers is one of the oldest branches of your armed forces. Among its global activities are the construction of Army and Air Force installations in the four corners of the world. The Civil Works program of the Corps of Engineers is carried out under congressional authority. It includes river and harbor development and flood control activities in the United States. The Seattle District Corps of Engineers serves the northwest corner of the United States. It includes a drainage area fed by three high mountain ranges. The Pacific Northwest is a region of rugged beauty. of towering mountains and crystal clear lakes. Scores of streams carry the water runoff to the Pacific Ocean. No other region is so blessed with life-giving water. Cascading from the mountains, foaming brooks turn into rivers flowing through rich agricultural valleys. Fishermen find thrills at the ripples and pools of streams and rivers. And in the valleys, the rivers provide water for irrigation in abundance. Valleys, towns, and rivers in this part of our great country bear strange names, names of Indian origin. The rivers have names like Duwamish, Snohomish, Skykomish, Stilaguamish, Samamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup. The name of this city is Tacoma, another Indian name. 68 miles southeast of Tacoma, a great mountain rears its lofty peak over 14,000 feet into the sky. Forest giants march up Mount Rainier's slopes toward its snowy peak. The high crags are filled with the eternal ice of the greatest glacier system in the United States. Here, rivers are born. Shallow brooks, at first they tumble down over rocks. They grow into streams rushing toward the valley below. They broaden into rivers now as they continue their way toward the sea. The river of our story, the White River, rises at Mount Rainier's Emmons Glacier. Like many others, it's joined by brooks and streams until it combines forces with the Puyallup River near Sumner, Washington. The rivers are a blessing to the farms of the valley. There are times when they become unpredictable villains. In the fall and winter, heavy rains drench the mountains and valleys. Downpours melt the snowpack in the mountains, and that spells danger every year. Then the peaceful rivers turn into raging torrents, often leaving destruction in their wakes. <laughs> any other villain, a rampaging river can be tamed. This is the story of a river and how it was brought under control. It is the story of Mud Mountain Dam. A flood control dam would minimize these yearly threats to rich agricultural regions. Townspeople could stop worrying when rivers began to rise. For Tacoma, it would mean the end of devastating floods to its industrial section and losses amounting to millions of dollars in property and production. But it takes time to build a dam. The Civil Works activities of the Army's Corps of Engineers are directed by Congress acting for the people. The proposal of a dam for flood control was initiated by the people of King and Pierce counties. Inter-county river improvement amounted to three million dollars since 1914. Despite these precautions, damage from a single flood in 1933 amounted to more than a million dollars. Congress authorized the flood control dam in 1936 and the initiative passed to the Seattle District Army Corps of Engineers. The logical location for the project was at Mud Mountain on the White River. The cliffs of the narrow canyon rose almost vertically to a height of 150 feet. Then the canyon widened out at the rim. 
Mud Mountain Dam is located 47 miles southeast of Seattle. The road takes you through rugged country toward Mount Rainier. The sign tells you you're very near the project. Follow the road for about two miles and you'll come to a rustic building set among towering trees. This is the observation building. Let's step inside and look at a model of the dam. Many different types of dams were designed and analyzed. It was decided that a rock fill dam would be the best type for this particular location. Mud Mountain Dam consists of a watertight earth core covered with transition zones of stone graded from fine to coarse. The transition zones are kept in place by slopes of quarry rock of varying sizes. In order to protect the structure against any possibility of overtopping, a concrete spillway was provided on the right bank. The model shows the position of the spillway in relation to the dam. The spillway was one of the first phases of construction. The concrete batching plant was located above the construction area. Concrete was taken by truck to a chute which carried the mixture to the point of construction. Another chute directed the concrete to the workers below where it was vibrated around the heavy reinforcing steel. presented a number of problems in concrete placing. This was an uphill job in more ways than one, not only for the men working the vibrators, but also for the finishers working below. Hanging on became a fine art here as they smoothed the surface of the spillway to the desired texture. Water will never pass over the spillway except in a flood of disastrous proportions. Before construction could begin, the White River had to be diverted. A tunnel 2,000 feet long and 23 feet in diameter was blasted through the rock wall of the canyon. Excavation was done from both ends with the upstream portal protected by a coffer dam. The structure was lined with concrete and, upon completion, the waters of the White River would pour through the tunnel. Then, man could begin throwing a barrier across the deep canyon. A source of material for the watertight core of the dam was found nearby. All logs and timber had to be cleared away. and topsoil were removed until the proper type of core material was exposed. This was the place from which the material for the dam's watertight core was taken. The borrow pit contained a layer of glacial till overlying a considerable depth of sand and gravel. The initial mix was made by the power shovels which scooped up the material and dumped it onto big trucks capable of carrying 8 to 12 yards at a time. The trucks took their loads to the screening and mixing plant located a short distance from the borrow pit. The material was dumped into hoppers and a carefully controlled screening system removed all boulders over six inches in diameter. A conveyor belt transported the material to the mixers above. Preliminary mixing was the second phase of the preparation process. The material was now ready for the trip to the drying plant. Two miles of track had been laid connecting the mixing plant with the dam site. The material was dropped into dump cars from a loading chute and a logging type engine, geared low for power, pulled the five car train over steep grades. at its destination, the train stopped at the unloading trestle high above the canyon floor. The cars were tilted and the material was dumped to the stockpiles below.
Approximately 14,500 carloads of material were required for the core of the dam. Bulldozers kept the hoppers well supplied, pushing the material toward the chutes above the conveyor belt. The Mud Mountain area is subjected to heavy rainfalls, causing a very high and fluctuating moisture content in the core material. Strict moisture control had to be maintained at all times, which necessitated the use of a large drying plant. Here the material was thoroughly mixed and the moisture content reduced to the required amount. At this time, work on a second tunnel, nine feet in diameter, was well underway. Mud Mountain Dam is a flood control project, and both the nine-foot tunnel and the valve system in the 23-foot tunnel would control storage and release of White River water. Two quarries supply the tremendous amounts of rock needed for the transition zones and the surface of the dam. Powder men place their charges into the Rocky Mountain side. their way into rock, excavating small tunnels. Called coyote holes, they were loaded with explosives by powder men. These men were experts at their job. When you do this sort of thing day after day, you get somewhat casual about it, but you never become careless. It required time to plan and coordinate blasts of this size, but finally the moment arrived. The face of the entire quarry was lifted, breaking the rock into usable sizes which could be handled by power shovels. This rock was used for the outer slopes of the dam. Rock for the transition zones was taken from the second quarry located adjacent to the White River Quarry. Rock for the outer slopes was taken directly from the quarry to the dam site. The material for the transition zones had to be crushed into suitable sizes. The crushing plant was located within the quarry proper. Crushed rock was stockpiled by bulldozers over a heavily constructed loading chute. In order to deliver the tons of quarry rock to the dam site, a haul road with a long trestle had to be constructed. The weight of the huge trucks carrying 24 yards, which would pound the trestle 24 hours a day, made it necessary to cover the trestle with reinforced concrete. Back at the drying plant, the roaring furnace continued its process. After the river had been diverted and excavation accomplished, actual construction of the dam was begun. Core material was taken from the drying plant to the rim of the canyon. A huge loading platform held two buckets intended to receive the processed material. A stiff-legged derrick swung the loaded buckets in a wide arc and lowered them slowly into the canyon. Men and machines were waiting on the rising core of the dam. Bulldozers spread the material evenly and each bucket load became part of the watertight core. Construction equipment included mechanical monsters like these. They're called sheep foot rollers. Going back and forth, they compacted the material. Work went along at a fast rate, but in the autumn, rainy weather threatened to nullify all efforts at keeping proper moisture content in the core material. There was one sure way to protect the construction area from the downpours. A king-size circus tent was erected covering the entire core of the dam. It afforded adequate protection. Workers as well as construction benefited from the use of the tent. The derrick kept lowering buckets filled with core material through a hole in the top of the tent. Day and night material was dumped on the fill and spread out by the bulldozers. Meanwhile, transportation of rock from both quarries was now in full swing. Large rock for the surface of the dam was loaded into trucks by power shovels at the White River Quarry. At the second quarry, trucks took on the processed rock for the transition zones.
Truck after truck left the quarries, taking material to the dam around the clock. The trucks rolled over the trestle in a never-ending stream. Starting from the Quarries Valley location, they wound their way around countless turns almost to the top of the canyon. Going down again, they passed the completed spillway as they rolled toward their destination. loaded trucks crossed and recrossed the core beneath the tent in order to drop their loads on the outer slopes. This process aided substantially in giving added compaction to the core material. They dumped their loads keeping men and machinery busy three shifts each day. The outer zones kept rising along with the core. Sluicing was required to achieve a rock-to-rock -rock bearing. A project of the size of Mud Mountain Dam required a large number of Corps of Engineers and contractors' personnel. The camp area included warehouses, repair shops, dormitories, mess halls, and a resident office. With the end of the rainy season, the tent could be removed. High riggers dismantled the supporting cables. It took iron nerve to do this work. Nothing but a narrow bosun's chair and a safety belt was between the man and the chasm below. The tent was down. Thousands of yards of the heavy canvas were taken apart, folded and removed from the canyon. The tent had served its purpose. With better weather and the cumbersome tent out of the way, construction was speeded up considerably. A second derrick increased the placing of the core material and the spreading went along at a much faster rate. Sheep foot rollers kept pace and the trucks continued their ceaseless work dumping rock on the transition zones and outer slopes. Men using air-driven tampers compacted the bond between the dam's core and the canyon wall. Smaller machines supplied them with needed material. The borrow pit adopted the increased tempo, keeping the drying plant and supply train busy. The demand for rock increased, blasts in the quarry became more frequent. Traffic on the Trestle Hall Road was getting heavier as loaded trucks made their way to the dam and others passed them returning for another load. Mud Mountain Dam kept rising with each passing day. At this time, work on the 23-foot tunnel progressed rapidly. The upstream intake structure was nearing completion. The tunnel was ready to be closed at river level. However, before the river could be diverted through the smaller nine-foot tunnel, provisions had to be made to get migratory fish to their spawning grounds on the upper reaches of the White River. 
Four miles downstream from the dam near Buckley, the Puget Sound Power and Light Company maintained a fish ladder serving to pass migratory fish over a low power dam on the White River. This existing facility was reconstructed and adapted to form a fish trap for temporary use during construction of Mud Mountain Dam. In 1949, the Corps of Engineers, Seattle District, installed a permanent structure. It is now a modern, smooth-working fish trap incorporating the latest fish handling devices. Fast water at the entrance of the trap attracts migratory fish to enter the structure at this point. Waiting for the fish, a cage is submerged into a compartment of the fish trap. The elevating grills are raised and compartment gates opened, allowing the fish to enter the cage. When it is filled, the gate is closed and the cage raised. It is then moved on overhead rails to a specially built tank truck, which is back under the cage. It is lowered now and fish are released into the truck for their long trip around the dam to the spawning grounds on the upper reaches of the river. Transfer from cage to truck is accomplished in a matter of minutes. The thousand gallon trucks are equipped with pumps which circulate the water providing the salmon with oxygen for the 12 mile trip. With its living wriggling load, the truck leaves the fish trap and enters the highway near Buckley. Traveling a short distance, the truck enters the town of Enumclaw. It passes the dam site and at its destination near Greenwater, Washington, the truck releases the migrants into the waters of the river to continue their trip to the spawning ground. Meanwhile, the dam now had risen to a point close enough to the top of the canyon to dispense with the derricks and buckets. A chute now dropped the material from the drying plant to the top of the core. In the area close to the chute, dozers leveled out the material. In areas at a distance from the chute, carryalls were used. This increased the tempo again since these construction machines could not only transport the material, but also spread it evenly as it was dropped through their bottom gates. Then as the dam rose to the level of the drying plant, the chute was eliminated and trucks picked up the material at the plant. Looking across the dam, the various zones could be clearly defined. The center core, transition zones, and the armor of quarry rock. The length of the dam across the canyon is 1,150 feet, including the spillway. From a width of 1,600 feet at the canyon floor, the structure tapers to a width of 50 feet at the top. The work was nearly done now. The upper portal of the 9-foot tunnel was placed in operation and the 23-foot tunnel was closed. Maintenance work at the dam includes removal of logs and debris from the reservoir. Due to the fact that debris tended to choke off the low intake of the nine-foot tunnel, a new higher structure was completed in February 1953. Logs and debris which bypass the upstream booms are removed from the tunnel intake by means of a steel hook which keeps the tunnel entrance open, allowing the water to flow through the tunnel. Most of the debris is disposed of by upstream booms. But in the early days of the project, the cable, tower, and high line were used for this operation. Cables were lowered to the reservoir where men secured them to logs. This was dangerous work. Because of the extreme depth of the canyon, most of the operation was done out of sight of the cableway operator. The work was directed by telephone from the bottom of the canyon. Once at the top, debris and useless logs were swung to an incline, rolled down to a prepared spot where they were safely disposed of by burning. Usable timber is salvaged by the United States Army and Navy Lumber Agency. Logs were taken to a nearby sawmill. 
They are cut to government specifications and stored away for use in military projects. Only useless logs were burned at the dam site. Mud Mountain Dam has served its purpose as a flood control project successfully for 15 years. Let's explain this purpose more fully. During normal flow, the nine-foot tunnel passes White River water to the valley below. At periods of floods, the water level behind the dam rises until the peak is reached. The 23-foot tunnel plays an important part in the purpose of the project. Three eight-foot valves were installed at the downstream portal. Another precautionary measure is an automatic gauging system installed on rivers not controlled by flood control projects. In the event of a sudden rise, the gauge flashes a warning to a radio relay network. During a time of flood danger, hourly readings are transmitted to the dam. As soon as messages are received, the maintenance crew at the dam relays the readings by radio phone to the Seattle District Corps of Engineers. From here, orders are issued for control of water flow at the dam. This stairway leads to the controls of the 23-foot tunnel valves where discharge of water is regulated and controlled. The flow can be increased or decreased as the occasion requires. In times of a threatening flood, the operator in the valve control building stops the flow, alleviating flood danger by decreasing the amount of water passing through the tunnel. Water is held in the reservoir, and the nine-foot tunnel releases a normal amount, assuring operation of a power plant near Buckley. After the downstream flood peak has passed, the operator activates the machinery, opening an eight-foot valve, and additional water is released, bringing the reservoir level down to normal, ready for the next flood cycle. Below the dam, fertile valleys, prosperous towns and their people are unaware that a flood threat has just passed them by. The city of Tacoma rests secure in the knowledge that Mud Mountain Dam has put an end to the yearly flood threats to its industrial section. This is Rainier, the Great Mountain. Moodily, it stares down on green valleys. Green and fertile because a treacherous river was harnessed by Mud Mountain Dam. Built by the Army's Corps of Engineers. Another job well done in its never-ending task of serving our nation.